Mark, we feel really, really guilty that we're dragging you away from writing the second element of the book, but there's so much we want to ask you. So we're really grateful for your time. And one of the lovely things about the Beatles, I think, is that I think for so many, the Beatles musical influences and the black musical influences are unknown. For some, it's a bit hidden. For others, there's kind of, there's a, a hint of apocryphal stories. But what the loveliest thing about the Beatles, I think, is that they're very open about those musical influences and are almost the, the, the best champions of it themselves. But the story goes back before they were even Beatles, doesn't it? It goes back to the time when they were teenagers and they first heard rock and roll and rhythm and blues and it changed their lives forever, didn't it? Well, you know, the Beatles have been around now for since the 1960s, which is a very long time, and now in the 2020s. So um, it's kind of not always easy for people to grasp the fact that when they were growing up, when they were kids, when they infants there was no rock and roll i mean we, it's been around now for so long that we're all accepting of it constantly um but it simply didn't exist and there wasn't a hole they didn't realize that they didn't have this thing they just didn't have it and they grew up listening to the bbc light program and there would be novelty tunes and popular songs and jazz and classical of course and then they were the perfect age between say well, George Harrison would have been 13 when rock and roll came out in 1956. 56 is the key year. Um, John, the eldest, was uh, went, was 16 that year, 15 to 16. So they were the age. I always think when you're about 14, that's when you most consume something like that because you're beginning to break away from parental influences and want to find something of your own. And along came Elvis Presley and it changed their lives overnight. Um, and that coincided also with skiffle music, which we tend not to think about very much, but skiffle music, which was, gave them the encouragement to get up and play, even though they weren't very good. That too has, is black in origin. I mean, it's, um, the origins of skiffle is 1920s Chicago rent party music. So if you lived in a tenement building in Chicago and you were black in the 1920s, you had either no job or a poorly paid job and you couldn't afford the rent, you would have a party and play music and people would come along and somehow or other the money would be scraped together and you would be able to pay the rent. So skiffle and rock and roll fused together in these boys' minds at the perfect age uh, in 1956-57 and that was it. And they became... Um, well, their lives were completely, the course of their lives were changed completely by music that was absolutely entirely of black origin. So um, the key moment, I suppose, really, uh, is in 1957 when uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney meet for the first time, the first time of significance anyway, um, when they actually stop and speak and when Paul sees John playing guitar, and that's in Walton in the south end of Liverpool. And the thing that struck Paul was that John was playing this record here, or this song on this record. I don't know if you can see that. Come Go With the Me by the Dell Vikings on the London American label. That's a 10 inch 78, very breakable. Yeah. <clears throat> now that was a really obscure record. It had come out in Britain. That is a British pressing I just held up, but no one knew it really. I mean, it wasn't in the charts. and. It certainly wasn't being played on the BBC. It was only heard really on Radio Luxembourg because Decca, the British record company that owned London, bought airtime and could play whatever records they wanted to play in their own show. So Paul knew that song and John knew that song, but almost nobody else did. So it wasn't only the fact that John was up there playing his guitar. It was the fact that he was playing that and that Paul knew it. Yeah. Because they were both connoisseurs of this extraordinarily rare, specialised music that was coming out of the States. And um, that was the turn on for Paul. It's just like, and, and the fact that John was, who hadn't heard it clearly, you know, Radio Luxembourg, the sound used to ebb and flow away on the medium wave. Yeah. And, yeah. and John hadn't heard the lyrics. He was never that brilliant at remembering lyrics anyway. So he was making up his own. And Paul knew enough about the record to know that the ones John was singing weren't the real ones, but they were other ones, they were clever ones, and, and that, that John made a huge impression on Paul. Had they been playing, had John been playing some Doris Day number, or you know, some something you know, 
Guy Mitchell or whatever, something else from the period. It may not have had the same impact on Paul, but because they were playing this rare bit of gold from Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, uh, that was it. That was, they connected. And a um, bit of research into the, the Dell Vikings, they were five black a USAF, US Air Force servicemen in Pittsburgh. But because they were servicemen, they were often flying in and out. You know, they weren't always on base at the same time. And the personnel of the Dell Vikings kept changing as a result. And along the way of all those changes, they were they became racially integrated, which was very rare for those days. So John and Paul were listening to essentially black music, but it had some racial integration as well. But I should point out, and this is a crucial factor to all of this, is that we now live in the information age. So whatever you want to find out, you just you know type into a search engine and click and you've got your answer, more or less, or you've got something anyway. In those days, these guys knew nothing. That was a record. Yeah. And that's all it was. It was a record. You could go and buy it in the shops or you could maybe, maybe hear it on the radio. But it came with no information whatsoever. So they didn't know who the Dell Vikings were or what their racial profile was or anything. They just knew it was a sound. And all these teenagers in the 50s and indeed into the 60s as well, they more they fell in love with the sound before they found out who these guys were. Um, but it happened to be a black sound and that was that was the best. So in 1956, the year before they actually met, um, there's in your book, uh, Mark, about... Um, uh, this um, school friend of John who went to Amsterdam and bought Long Tall Sally. It was on a, a quarry bank uh, a school trip, but he, he bought a 78 in Amsterdam and brought it back. Lennon was obviously obsessed with Elvis at the time, but then he, he said to him, uh, come and listen to this. I'll, I'll play you something that will blow your mind. And he said it's the first time, Lennon admitted the first time he'd ever been speechless after hearing a record. How, how did you research that? How did you research that? Uh, that was a, a, a boy who was, I think, at Dovedale School with John Lennon and then graduated to Quarry Bank. They both went to the grammar school, Quarry Bank. So he was aware of John Lennon throughout all of his school years. Uh, John was the bad boy at, at the grammar school. You know, he and his mate Pete Shotton were the disruptors. Uh, and um, parents had always warned their children to keep away from that Lennon because he'll get you into trouble. Uh, but but he was obviously a magnetic personality and Michael Hill was around him and I don't think they were super close, but they were close enough. And then he went on that school trip to Amsterdam um, and went into a record shop uh, and came out with this 78 on a Belgian record label called Ronix. Here it is. That is the oh. record. It's got Long Tall Sally on really? one side and Slipping and Sliding on the other. This is a second really? copy I bought on eBay because the first copy, I could hear it when I shook the box when it arrived. <laughs> it arrived in 100 pieces. Not a good sound when you're buying a 78. Um, but I've got another one. There aren't that many around, but it is a... I mean, I just had to have it. That is the record that turned John Lennon on to not only Little Richard, but to the notion of this music being sung by black musicians, by black artists, because yeah. Elvis was the king and Elvis was white and they knew enough about Elvis to know what he looked like. They'd never seen a picture in the Daily Mirror or the New Musical Express and that was about it. Um, but when, so they go back to this Michael Hill's got the record, tells John, I've got this amazing record. They go back to his house, I think on Rose Lane, in kind of Allerton around Penny Lane area. Yeah. Uh, and John is floored. I mean, completely speechless by both Long Tour Sally and Slipping and Sliding. And then someone in the room says that he's black. And John just, what? He's black? It's just like the, these people didn't have a skin color. They were just singers. And then suddenly, oh, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. And that was a complete eye opener. What he said was, um, this is John speaking to the journalist Maureen Cleave. I didn't know Negroes sang, because Negroes was the word then. It wasn't in any way offensive. It was just the word of the day. So Elvis was white and little Richard was black. Thank you, God, I said. And I thought about it for days at school, the labels of the records. One, little Richard was yellow and Elvis Presley was blue. Now, 
that's the Elvis Presley. That is not actually the Elvis record, but that was the Elvis record on that label, I mean, mm. HMV, blue. So John's thinking, little Richard's yellow and he's black and Elvis Presley's white and he's blue. And this is turning over around in his head. And uh, he said, somebody said that the blacks gave the middle class whites back their bodies. It was the only thing to get through to me out of all the things that were happening when I was 15. Rock and roll was real and everything else was unreal. And that's what he said to Rolling Stone in 1970. Mm. So immediately, any notion, I mean, racial prejudice was absolutely rife, as it always has been. Um, but in the 1950s, post-war Britain, um, with the first wave of immigration from the West Indies, racism was absolutely rife in Britain. Um, but for these guys, for whom the music was the thing, it disappeared because they, they, they were their heroes. It, it? Sorry? It transcended it, but also these guys were their heroes. You know, I mean, they went to see Little Richard in um, The God Can't Help It at the Palais Deluxe, I think it was, on Lime Street. And um, it's just like, there he is. It's like the Elvis is God and this guy's God and Chuck Berry's God. And it wasn't exclusively black and it wasn't exclusively white. They loved Jerry Lewis and they loved Little Richard. Yeah. They loved Elvis Presley and they loved Chuck Berry. The music was the thing. Um, but the more they learned, the more they realized that their taste naturally was for um, black originated music. I mean, they always said that they thought Elvis was black, didn't, didn't they? But their tastes overlapped and we, we tend to think of Paul as being the big Little Richard fan. Um, where does John sit in, in terms of Chuck Berry? Where does he sit in their early kind of oeuvre of their music? They, they just loved, they loved originality. I mean, the Beatles were in essence, uh, as artists themselves, completely original, but they did consume all these influences. Uh, and they particularly gravitated to other people who were original. They could always spot a copy a mile away. I mean, when you're a connoisseur of something, you do form strong opinions, right? And when you're a group of 15, 16, 17, 18 year old lads, um, you very quickly decide what's great and what's crap, you know? Uh, and crap was the word, and they just wouldn't give it the, the time of day. And that basically yeah. meant excluding anything that was British with one or two honourable exceptions like Johnny Kidd shaking all over and Cliff Richards move it. They just, anything British was, you know, soft. Um, yeah. The real deal was American and, and yeah. it didn't really matter there what colour skin you were, but that means it didn't count against you either. Um, so they love Chuck Berry and they love Carl Perkins and they love Jerry Lee Lewis and they love Lloyd Price. And they loved, I mean, I, this is a guy that is quite, quite um, obscure still, Arthur Alexander. Yeah. Uh, well, you can see that this is a compilation album on the yeah. great, on the great Ace label mm -hmm. from the 1980s, 82. Um, th that was a record. They used to go into the record shops and ask to hear records. Um, I mean, no clicking a mouse to go on Spotify or any other streaming service. I mean, you, you had to make the effort. Yeah. And they used to go yeah. into Liverpool, had loads of record shops. In particular, there was Brian Epstein's shop, NEMS. And they would go in there and they would ask for anything that was American in origin. And they would look at the labels to see. But some labels had more original stuff than others. And one of them was Pi International, um, yeah. which had Arthur Alexander's uh, record. Um, no, sorry. Arthur Alexander's You Better Move On. That was the big one. Uh, and A Shot of Rhythm and Blues. And it's just such a kind of two great sides and they both went straight into the Beatles set. They just like played them that night. They just played it over and over in the booth and wrote down the words and tried to memorize it and, and played it. And they knew nothing about this guy, nothing about him at all. He was from Alabama and he, you know, he was from Sheffield, Alabama and he was John's age. They assumed he was black because of his voice. It's got that kind of richness to it, but they really didn't know anything about him. But this record was clearly original you know nobody else was making a sound like that and they just had to have it they just they just edit up you know you, you touched on luxembourg mark where else might they hear it before they challenge you know had a, had a go at um trying to listen to it at a record shop there weren't many other places i mean some if, if you had a record you go to 
I mean, they would go to parties and people would take their records to a party. If you go in a, a secondhand record store now or a charity shop, you might find a 45 with someone's name on the label. And that was always done by kids because they would take their records to a party. And at the end of the party, they want to, which one's mine? And they can see their name mm. on it and they take it home. Um, <laughs> uh, Paul has said that they used to go to those parties and nick records that other people had very, very naively brought along. Mm. Um, so, yeah, they they would do anything. Um, Paul talks tells that story of getting on a bus with George to go to someone's house because he knew B seven on the guitar, um, <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. But, and George said the thing about you know because everything became so easily obtained in later decades, even say by the eighties and nineties. We, it was being forgotten that back in the 50s it was rationing and everything seemed rationed. He said, yeah. you, know, you couldn't get a cup of sugar, mm. let alone a rock and roll record. But it meant that, so, it meant that um, they had the, the passion of, of those who collect something scarce, you know. When something's so easily come by, you don't value it quite as much as if you really had to make the effort. Mm -hmm. And if fewer of you are doing it, because it's making the effort sorts out the, the the real diehards from the easily falling away guys you know those who just go out come from. mark there was a light entertainment show wasn't there you said that uh, paul mccartney heard ray charles what did i say jotted down the name of it of the record and then bought it when it came out then they started taking it to parties and making sure it got played all the time so listen to this what did i say was another big one for the Beatles. Uh, well, they weren't even the Beatles. This is 1959 we're talking about. Um, it's a yeah, myth It's yeah. a myth that the BBC didn't play any of this music, but they, they certainly didn't play much for reasons that are much more complicated than we've got the time to go into. Um, but also um, for legitimate reasons that um, indicates that the way they're always being beaten up because they weren't interested in this music, that's, that's not the whole truth either. Um, but nonetheless, John, Paul was in bed late one night listening to the BBC Light programme and David Jacobs, who was regular presenter DJ in those days, was playing What Did I Say? And uh, he did the cool thing of playing both sides of it because it was a part one and part two oh, yeah. 45. He'd turn it over yeah, to yeah. carry on. And he actually did play both sides and Paul scribbled it down and went into, was it NEMS or some? I can't remember which shop it was that he said he got it in, but he went and bought it anyway. And um, when they went to, I mean, it's a long track. What did I say? It runs about six minutes in total, uh, which in those days was very long. Most pop records were two minutes. And um, when they got to Hamburg and they were playing all night long, that's not the song all night long, when they were actually having to play on stage for the whole night. <laughs> yeah. um, hours. They would do very extended versions of what did I say, you know, like 20, 25 minutes, half an hour or whatever, because what else was there to do when you've done everything you know, you might as well do a very, very long what did I say. Um, yeah, Ray Charles was, was a big influence. Um, there were so many of them. There's a guy called James Ray, had a record out called If You Gotta Make a Fool of Somebody. That's the one I was thinking of earlier when I said it was on Pi International, um, not the Arthur Alexander record. But um, James Ray, If You Gotta Make a Fool of Somebody, was just like the sound that they wanted to have. I asked Paul in 1987 when I first interviewed him what sound the Beatles were trying to get before they broke through. And he said, if the Beatles ever wanted a sound, it was R&B. That's what we used to listen to. That's what we used to like. That's what we wanted to be. Black. That was basically it. Arthur Alexander. It came out whiter because it always does. We're white and we're just young Liverpool musicians. We didn't have any finesse to actually sound black. So, but if they could have done, they would have done. And there are attempts by the Beatles, like on the With The Beatles album, where they're not exactly trying to sound black, but they're certainly so heavily influenced by that music that what they're writing is in the same vogue. And in a sense, it's John trying to be Smokey Robinson, say. Mark, didn't Little Richard, when he saw them at the uh, uh, New Brighton, uh, he was asked to go in by Brian Epstein. It was the Billy J. Kramer's manager was asked to go in and ask Little Richard what he thought of the Beatles. And he, he said something like, I thought those guys were black listening to them. 
Yes, which was the highest compliment that they could possibly have had. I mean, they they themselves used that in marketing for just a little while that little Richard, the great little Richard had yeah. said this about them, that they actually did sound black. Uh, yeah, New Brighton Tower yeah. Ballroom, that was a momentous night in the formation of, of what became known as Mersey Beat and the rise of the Beatles, yeah. Within that night, Mark, there's that fantastic photograph taken afterwards of the Beatles with little Richard and Joe Ankara from The Chance, Sugar D and Derry Wilkie. Was there much connection with the black music scene in, in Liverpool at that time with the Beatles? There was hardly any black music scene in Liverpool then. I mean, Derry Wilkie was an original from the late 50s. He was in the Beatles, I always think, were in the second wave of the Liverpool groups that were coming through. If you count a wave as just being 18 months to two years. The Beatles surfaced in 60, 61, um, and there'd been a scene from about 58, and Derry Wilkie had been in the first vanguard of it. Uh, and he had a group called Derry and the Seniors, which was uh, a play on Danny and the Juniors, the American group, Danny and the Juniors. <laughs> and um, and Derry was, you know, an authentic uh, black guy from Liverpool 8. Uh, but there, he was the only one, really. Um, then in 62, there was this vocal group called The Shades. They became The Chance. At the time when that picture was taken, they were just in transition from The Shades to The Chance. And they were they were more of a vocal group in the kind of doo-wop style. They didn't play any instruments. They would sing at the microphone and they needed backing. And there were a handful of occasions when the Beatles actually did back them. No photographs, unfortunately. We've got that one picture from New Brighton Tower with Little Richard, but when the Beatles were backing the chants or the shades as they became the chants, sadly no pictures have surfaced to that and it would be a great thing to see. They were doing things like um, Gene Chandler's Duke of Earl, which was a number that they liked to do. You can, you know, it's a vocal number essentially, but they needed some backing. Um, and then people say Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, managed the chants. I've never seen any evidence of that actually in reality, but he did look out for them to an extent and um, in 1964 uh, he booked them into some shows in London and the Beatles did shows with the Chance and a group called the Harlands who were another British black vocal group because um, Brian Epstein was also like the Beatles you know he, he they turned him on to all this music and he quickly came to hear what was authentic and what wasn't and that meant you know the, the, the American stuff was authentic really so the, but the amazing thing is that Liverpool, these groups in Liverpool, they were all into their rock and roll and their R&B. Um, but the audiences were almost entirely white because of the ghettoization in that existed in those days. The black district up in Upper Parliament Street and Toxteth around Liverpool 8, they didn't really get out of their zone very much at all. I mean, people told me that mm. you, you hardly ever saw them in the city centre. Um, and I asked Sam Leach once if black people ever went to, the, to see the Beatles or any, indeed any of the other groups that there were. And he said, hardly ever. You never saw a black face in the cavern, which was so sad because mm. on stage they're revering all this music. But, um, mm. you know, life was much more divided then. We didn't have the integration then that we've become more familiar with since. He did go to Lord Woodbine's club, didn't he, on uh, Upper Parliament Street. Um, I mean, and for, for, for three young uh, white lads to actually go there and to allegedly back uh, a stripper uh, playing a background music, I mean, that must, it's, that's really a situation which you wouldn't expect in those days. Can you explain what really happened? Yeah, well, um, the Beatles first uh, came upon, I keep saying the Beatles, I mean, they, they, re they weren't really the Beatles yet. They were just kind of becoming Beatles very slowly. Um, but as as yeah. the, the um, as kids from the Liverpool Institute and the uh, which Paul and George were at and um, the, the art school which John and Stuart were at, they used to go into the Jacaranda Coffee Bar in Slater Street, and that was run by one of the city's few beatniks, uh, Alan Williams, uh, and his wife Beryl, and they had suffered quite a lot of racial prejudice themselves because Beryl was uh, of Chinese origin. Uh, though born in Liverpool, her parents were Chinese and well, Alan Williams told me they used to get spat at and things like that in the street. 
Um, but they stuck to their guns and they opened this coffee bar and it became the hangout place for everybody. And uh, they booked Caribbean Steel Band for the basement. Um, and that was um, the Royal Caribbean Steel Band and that was Lord Woodbine. And Woody, as he was affectionately known, uh, Harold Phillips was his real name, and Alan Williams were great friends. Uh, and they were entrepreneurs together and they opened a, a dingy little illegal uh, strip club just off Upper Parliament Street on Kimberley Street. And um, they got in this stripper in about July 1960 who insisted that she wasn't going to strip to records like other strippers had. She would only strip to live <laughs> backing. Um, and Williams, who yeah. would have would have wanted to pay them very little um, and turned to the Beatles who weren't expecting much um, and who were kicking around with nothing to do. And so they spent a few days backing this stripper whose name may have been Janice, but maybe not. Uh, and they backed her. So they knew Woodbine and they knew Williams. And um, the two of them really cooked up this whole Hamburg experience, which without which probably we wouldn't be having this conversation now because Hamburg is the great, for the Beatles, it's the great, um, it's the great fuse of all their talents and ambition and their desire to play all coming into play at the same time. And um, Williams drove them over in this little minibus that he had and Woodbine did some of the driving as well. So it was kind of a black and white enterprise that got the Beatles off to Hamburg. And there's the picture of them stopping at the war memorial in Arnhem in Northern Holland en route yeah. to Hamburg. Uh, and Woody's in the picture and Alan and Beryl. Um, and three of the, four of the Beatles, but not John uh, and Pete, who was born in India. So there's actually quite a cosmopolitan mix there. And the Beatles themselves, of course, heavily Irish background. So there's, there's, a, there's a real melting pot. And that was... The great thing about this this music um, that they all wanted to play was that it did encourage a lot of them coming together of disparate people uh, in getting it all together. And, and beyond the strip club and in Liverpool, like did did they venture further into any of the social clubs in there, the Shabines in there? Yeah, Shabeen. That was a word I first read about in Alan Williams's first book, mm -hmm. The Man Who Gave the Beatles Away. Uh, an Irish Gaelic word meaning place of illegal drinking, an illegal drinking establishment. Um, and yeah, uh, Woody had one called the Colony Club on Barclay Street, again, right in the heart of Toxteth, Barclay Street, um, where incidentally, um, John's mother had grown up just opposite there uh, a couple of decades earlier, which I think John would have had no idea about. But um, yeah, they used to go to um, the Colony Club uh, and sit there and share a bottle of whiskey or whatever. And it was one of those places that was always about to get raided um, because it wasn't licensed and it, you could drink out of hours there. Pub hours were very narrow and restricted and you could get a pier, you could go at one o'clock in the morning and get a drink, but you might get raided. Um, so that, that was the kind of place that Woody ran. And uh, and of course, you know, they, they all hung out together and it really didn't matter. You know, I mean, these were uncool times back. I can't stress this enough. If you read the music press of the late 50s into the early 60s, big national organizations like Mecca uh, will be running ballrooms in cities and towns around the country with a color bar. So if you went, if you were black and you went to go and you'd be refused admission. We had no race relations act in those days. That didn't come in until later in the 60s. Um, Butlins, the holiday camp where so many people went, particularly uh, working class people, um, they were always denying that they had a colour bar, but they did. I mean, that's why they were having to deny it so often, because actually there was one. Um, and, you know, Ringo grew up at Butlins, in a sense, playing with Roy Storm and the Hurricanes. He wouldn't have wanted there to be a colour bar, but there was a colour bar because that was the, the way it was run. And so you've got to take a hat off to any white people who were prepared to forsake all of that and just hang out with the people that they wanted to hang out with rather than, you know, abide by, you know, run the risk of, um, of people's criticism. You know, they never cared what people thought. And that, that was very important to who they were and what they did. John had 
a, a man, a, a great friend at art school who looked, who was, well, he had a kind of Middle Eastern uh, and Far Eastern origins, but he certainly looked like he was Indian. Jeff Muhammad, his name was, and he and John were super close pals. So, you know, really, these, these were rare guys to whom these things didn't matter. Hamburg connection is pivotal in the story of the Beatles, but it involves Jerry, Jerry Wilkie uh, and uh, an appearance or a cancelled uh, concert um, summer season with Jerry Wilkie um, and Alan Williams was representing them at the time. Could you talk us through how that came about and how the Hamburg connection was um, came about through that um, cancellation? How did the, being that Hamburg was so essential to the Beatles' development, it's it's an interesting thing to consider how it actually happened, and it all happened because of the Royal Caribbean Steel Band, who were the the resident group in the little basement downstairs at the Jacaranda Coffee Bar. Um, suddenly, Williams came in one day, and they weren't there, and and they kind of disappeared, and it, it turned out that they had been lured to Hamburg by some. German bar owner who had been in the Jacaranda and said, you know, you guys play good music. Why don't you come and play in my bar? And uh, they disappeared and went off mm -hmm. to Hamburg. And I think they must have sent a postcard back to say where they were. So Alan Williams in particular, who was always a, a, an operator for, had a sharp eye for opportunities to open clubs. He was in, he was very enthused about clubs was Alan. And um, he and Woody went on a, businessman's flight to Amsterdam for a weekend. You can imagine what kind of a weekend that would have been. Uh, and then they took off on their own beyond Amsterdam and they went into, they got the train into Hamburg. They gravitated to, um, not exactly to the red light district, but to the street where all the sailors bars were, which was nearby, uh, the Gorsa Freiheit, and um, went into a bar there and Alan Williams had brought a tape with him from Liverpool of different acts, not just rock and roll acts, but anybody that he kind of could claim to have represented, singers and so on, uh, and tried to sell the notion of exporting music to this bar owner, Bruno Koschmieder. And the tape got mangled, this is a long story, but the tape got mangled somehow along the way and it turned out to be unplayable. So Williams tried his best to sell them by word, but it was difficult. And that seemed to be the end of that until a different Williams um, endeavor um, came into view, which was that he had an association with the great impresario of the day of the British rock and roll era, Larry Palms. Larry Palms, who had discovered and renamed the likes of Tommy Steele, Billy Fury, Marty Wilde, Vince Eager, and so on. And um, yeah. he got, uh, I think it was um, Derry and the Seniors, to um, a, a contract to back, I think, Billy Fury in a summer season on Great Yarmouth Pier. This is, all, this is the pre-Beatles world of British rock and roll. And um, it fell through <laughs> at the last minute. They'd all given up their jobs to go and do it. And then it fell through. And Williams knew he had to do something for them. So heroically... He, he piles them all into his minibus and drives 200 miles from Liverpool down to London to see if he can get them on at the Two Eyes Coffee Bar. Now, the Two Eyes Coffee Bar was famous in those days for having been the place where Tommy Steele was discovered and then Cliff Richard. So it was like the cavern of its, of its day. You know, if you wanted to be discovered, you went to the Two Eyes. So he goes to the Two Eyes with Derry and the Seniors, puts them on stage, and who should be there but this guy from the bar in Hamburg, Bruno Koschmieder, by complete chance, he's there. Unbelievable. Um, yeah. yeah, and they do a deal right then and there for Daring the Seniors to go to Hamburg and play at the Kaiserkeller Bar, um, which I think begins in July 1960. And it goes so well that Koschmieder gets in touch and says, I've got a second bar. Would you send another group? And it wasn't always going to be the Beatles, but by process of elimination and other groups being unable or undesirous of going, the Beatles went and history was changed. Yeah. Uh, out in Hamburg, although John and Paul were building their repertoire of original material, they were primarily a covers band, weren't they still? What sort of material were they playing out there? 
Well, it was a great shock to the Beatles because Alan Williams had been getting them some engagements in June, July, 1960. Um, and they would play up to two hours, but actually in reality, less than that. Usually at places over the water from Liverpool on the Wirral. Um, but they didn't really have a lot of stage experience. They'd been kicking around since 57, but they hadn't been on stage a huge amount. And they got to the Indra and they were being asked to play anything between four and a half to six hours a night, six nights a week. And that taxed them. They said, well, what do we know? What can we play? I mean, important thing about the Beatles and their mentality right from this very moment, though, is that they took it upon themselves not to repeat themselves. Now, they were playing in bars. These weren't concerts. So very few people, if anybody, was ever there for all of it. It was a bar. You'd go in, you'd have a drink, there'd be a group on stage, you might pay them attention, you might just carry on your conversation. You'd finish your drink and go. So very few people would have been there the whole time, but on the basis that somebody might. Paul, I think, was the driver of this, and brilliant it was. So I said, well, we won't repeat ourselves, so no one will hear us do the same song twice. They won't come in and say, didn't they do that one earlier, because we won't have done it earlier. So they had to rack their brains for everything they knew. They would do everything on the first Elvis LP, everything on the first Carl Perkins LP, everything on the first Chuck Berry LP, whatever they could remember. And they used to rearrange old standards like, um, I think they even did It's a Long Way to Tipperary. I mean, they would just rock up anything, basically. <laughs> um, now, remember that in the Beatles' minds, rock and roll was the name for this music in its totality. So when you've yeah. got the first Elvis record, they're not all like Blue Suede Shoes. He's doing I Forgot to Remember to Forget, which is a country song or he's whatever. You know, he's doing a range of music, but it was called a rock and roll LP. So in the Beatles' minds, it was all rock and roll. And so anything was fair game. I mean, they loved doing Gene Vincent's version of the Wizard of Oz song Wiz um, Over the Rainbow, for example. And because Gene had done it, it was OK for them to. So you get Paul singing somewhere over the rainbow, but with a kind of Gene Vincent backing because it was rock and roll. And that's what you could do. So um, they are hardly playing their own songs. They were It was almost entirely covers uh, and it, it was anything, but it was primarily black. So it was every, everything they knew of Chuck Berry and everything they knew of Little Richard. Um, and um, who was the other guy? That, oh, Larry Williams. Larry Williams uh, was another. He was on the specialty label in America. Um, same as Little Richard. He did Slow Down and Dizzy Miss Lizzy and um, Bad Boy and mm -hmm. Boney Maroney and all those kind of songs. So they would just do everything. When they played the Top Ten Club in 1961, they would have to do seven to eight hours a night, seven nights a week. So Jeez. this this was an insane amount of stage experience for them. Eight, eight days a week. Yeah, or eight, eight days a week. Yeah, I mean, an insane amount of stage experience for them. So they came back to Liverpool at the end of their first visit to Hamburg. No one in Liverpool knew who they were because they hadn't played in Liverpool. They'd only played over the water. And that was a few months earlier. Um, and they were billed as the Beatles from Hamburg. And so everyone assumed they were German. And, you know, you speak good English, don't you? And well, we only live down the road, you know. But, um, and that was it. I mean, they, they were, they were, they were completely tight and together and professional. And that's the other thing about the Liverpool music scene is that it, it had enough venues to support a number of bands being entirely professional. It didn't have to have a day job because they could earn enough money at night. And that was another great accelerator of, of how it all unfolded. But the thing that's intrigued me is that it, it's it's absolutely clear their, their love of rhythm and blues and the big hitters like you've mentioned, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Larry Williams. Yet their first album has got four covers on. And there's kind of more of a kind of a do-what feel of it. And, and the great thing is three of them are female artists. Yes, well... Mm. A big thing happens. Black, black in, female artist. Absolutely. A big thing happens in 1961, 62, because the Beatles' taste is ever evolving. They, they, they banked what they liked and they never forgot it, but they didn't stop there. 
So they didn't get stuck with Elvis. They loved Elvis and he was their, always their number one hero. But they didn't only listen to Elvis and they were they continually had their ears tuned to what was new. And what was new in 61 was this great sound coming out of a, a New York, which was the Gold Group sound. Um, the first great breakthrough being Will You Love Me Tomorrow by the Shirelles. And yeah. once they got into the Gold Group sound, then there were lots of other groups to discover. Um, the Cookies doing um, uh, Chains. Chains? Chains, yeah. yeah. Um, that was or the Cookies, as they said, because they were from Liverpool. <laughs> they didn't say Cookies, the Cookies. Um, cookies. The Cookies. <laughs> the, the great thing about um, the Gold Group sound was that it was an East Coast sound and it was. It was the brilliant coming together of two lots of racially abused people, which is Jewish people and black people, because they both suffered racism forever and still do to this day. And um, typically will be Jewish songwriters like Goffin and King or Lieber and Stoller or Doc Pomus and Mort Schumann um, and record companies. Uh, like um, Scepter, which the Shirelles were on, which was um, Florence Greenberg, that was her record label, and black talent like Luther Dixon, who would write some of the songs that they loved. He wrote Boys, that was a Luther Dixon song. And the singers were typically girls from American schools. Like the Shirelles were from, they were all at school together. And all this comes out of the church, this, this boys or girls singing together. I mean, the influence of the black black churches gospel gospel music on r and b is immense and it's still filtering through so when you get to this album the beatles are into their girl group sound this is an original copy of please please me from 63 right. and what are they doing on here they're doing um chains um which was the kookies that was goffin and king they're doing boys which was, <laughs> was the shirelles that's luther dixon um, they're doing Baby It's You, which is uh, another pair of Jewish songwriters, Bacharach and David. Um, that was for the Shirelles. Um, they're doing um, Anna, Go To Him. When they get to the second album, this piece of deliciosity with the Beatles, um, then their, their music has evolved again because during the course of 63, they got more and more and more heavily into what was coming out on Tamla. Tamla yeah. Motown, except in Britain that label didn't exist yet and the Tamla sounds were coming out on the likes of um, Oriol and Fontana, that's how you would get the Motown records. Motown yeah. didn't yet exist as a record label in Britain, not till I think 60, I'm trying to remember, was it 65? I'll stand correct, I'll get that right in volume two, but anyway, um, so on this one they're doing um, Please Mr Postman, that's the Marvelettes. Yeah. Um, you really got a hold on me, which was Smokey Robinson, The Miracles. It was actually not Smokey Robinson and The Miracles, it was just The Miracles. But it's Smokey, it's his song and he's singing it. Devil in Her Heart is a, a little obscure group called the Donnays, or I think it's Donnays, yeah. might be Donnays, Donnays. Uh, and Money, um, which is the closing track on this album, um, which had been done by Barrett Strong. That was one of the first Tamla Motown records. Yeah. Um, they closed this album with Twist and Shout by the Isley Brothers. Right. Um, yeah. And they closed this album with Money by Barrett Strong. And arguably, and I would, be, I would argue this, they actually eclipsed the originals with their cover versions. Mm. Because as brilliant as those originals are, as, as authentic as they are, you can't get more authentic than that. There was something about the way the beat was covered that was just they would they would kind of slightly rearrange um, and they would make it so exciting. So yeah, Mark, on the John Lennon shoebox um, that was on the South Bank show many years ago, uh, the Isley Brothers uh, talk about the screaming uh, that they said the Beatles uh, imitated. Um, can you go into that a little bit? And Little Richard was another reason that they screamed as well. They particularly loved yeah, the way yeah. that, I mean, Paul would do Little Richard almost as good as Little Richard. I mean, one of Paul's friends at um, <laughs> the Institute, Ian James, 
who taught Paul the guitar. And within about a week, Paul had kind of whizzed past him in, in ability because that was Paul. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Ian, Ian James said that little Richard's voice would bubble out of Paul. It would erupt out of him in the middle of anything, a, a given moment, any <laughs> given moment. And suddenly, little Rick Paul would go, Woo! you know, because I mean, that, that's, match. yeah, they were just, they just loved these people. And, and great thing about the Beatles was that they never claimed anything falsely. They would always say where they got things from. And one of the reasons that we have such knowledge of their influences is because they were so open in, in expressing their admiration for where they got things from. Um, and even that extended to when they nicked things like, um, we know that the bass line in uh, the Beatles I saw standing there is the same bass line as Chuck Berry's. Is it, you can't catch, uh, talking about you, it is talking about you. Yeah, because, yeah. because Paul said it in 64 yeah. in an interview in the beat instrumental magazine this is like that's where i nicked yeah. it from he says so um they were very <laughs> open in in everything and that yeah. in uh, it's not only a very endearing trait but also brilliant for those who wish to study where they got things mm. from mark also on uh, john lennon's shoebox bobby parker is featured um and you know he, he was flattered that the beatles um almost copied, um, interpreted it, one of his guitar licks. But is it a case of that Bobby Parker would have got that from someone else, Dizzy Gillespie or whatever, and it, in the blues, everything was passed on? In reality, I mean, if you really dig into your into music history, you can find where Chuck Berry got his sound from, you know, and yeah. you, you can find where Carl Perkins got his sound from. And to these, to the Beatles, yeah. these guys were the originals, but, but what in life is, is certainly in terms of creative art is ever truly original. I mean, the best creative art is where you take, you absorb the things that inspire you and then you, you turn yeah. them into something new and fresh. It's, but it's still got right. bits of yeah. something else. It's still got ingredients, but you just baked it differently and added something of your own and you, and you've got yeah. new art. And, um, I was irritated in that John Lennon Jukebox think, thing because they made like Charles in there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they loved doing Some Other Guy by Richie Barrett. Yeah. Um, that was a big, yeah. big song for the Beatles. Um, but really, they, they used to call it Son of What Did I Say? Because, it, I mean, you wouldn't, have, yeah. you wouldn't have Some Other Guy if you hadn't have had What Did I Say first. You know, I mean, it leans quite heavily on it. It's still a great track in its own right, but it, it leans heavily on it. In that, in that John Lennon south bank show about his jukebox i got a bit irritated because the director seemed to be trying to make bobby parker say that he should have had a royalty because he had been ripped off and yeah he didn't look comfortable yeah. in the end eventually they pressed him enough and he said it and they of course the director used it but he didn't look comfortable saying it because it wasn't really what he thought no. and besides they it was three mm. notes it was just three notes and why do we know this because yeah. john lennon went on radio in new york in 1974 and said Bobby Park, let's let's listen to because he was with the DJ putting on whatever records they like. Let's listen to Bobby Parker's "Watch Your Step." Yeah. We had, that was part yeah. of what led to "I Feel Fine." Great, you know that's absolutely yeah. fine. We wouldn't be talking about Bobby Parker if they hadn't done that. By the time we get to, by the time we get to Beatles for Sale and Long Tall Sally, they've gone further back again, haven't they? In terms of the 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 covers they've done on there, they've gone back to the probably the big three: Chuck Berry, Little Richard. Larry Williams, is, was that the pressure of just touring and recording and, and making films? I don't know. I, I mean, I guess if they had had enough... Well, sentimental and there were still only 23. If, if they'd had enough originals, they maybe wouldn't have done the covers that they did do. But um, it always makes me laugh, actually, because people say, because the first album had cover versions on it, and the second album had cover versions on it, and the third one, A Hard Day's Night, didn't. People look down on this, the fourth one, because it's got cover versions on it, and it's just like, oh, well, they must have run out of originals or whatever. It was their fourth album. Three of them had covers on. So with hindsight, it looks yeah. like they, they run out of ideas, but maybe they just wanted to do the covers. The question you're asking is, why did they choose these covers? And I'm not exactly sure, but they do go back. You're quite right. They do rock and roll music, which is Chuck Berry. They do Mr. Moonlight, which was um, Dr. Feelgood, a real obscure record, Dr. Feelgood and the interns. 
Little Richard, Kansas City. That was Paul singing that, of course. Um, Buddy Holly. It's the only Buddy Holly song they did in their main catalogue for EMI. Words of Love. Carl Perkins, two numbers on here, Honey Don't and Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby. Um, I may have missed one, but I think there's six covers on here in total and eight originals. And they do, they do all go back, you're quite right, to that 50s period. I'm not quite sure why they chose I, those I'm, songs. I, I was, yeah, I was wondering if maybe they're more familiar with them or they're just getting more affection for them because of the distance from that time, maybe four or five years. But there's a gem missing from it, isn't it, that was left off for Mr. Moonlight? Uh, Leave My Kitten Alone um, is, yeah. is the outtake from that album, the, the track they recorded but didn't issue. We do now have it. It's on the anthology. And that's um, Little Willie John. Um, so, yeah, that that's one. This one, this has got Long Tall Sally on it. Larry Williams is Slow Down and Carl Perkins' Matchbox. When we talked about Twist and Shout earlier, this this is a huge record in 1963, the Twist and Shout EP. Uh, and of mm. course, it's all the songs they did on the BBC that we now have on the two BBC compilation albums. Mm. You know, they did a great many um, tracks that have been formative for them that, that they weren't going to be putting down on record at Abbey Road, but they did them in the BBC studio. And thankfully, we have the tapes mm. and uh, their repertoire was extraordinarily broad uh and but it, it knew no it knew no boundaries you know i mean a good song was a good song was a good song and partly because they'd grown up in the pre-rock and roll era they weren't prejudiced against anything that came before it so um it was fair game for, oh. them, for them to do any kind of broadway show tunes or anything that was a good song for songs like um devil in his heart devil in her heart um, isn't it a case of that they were just looking for most obscure tracks they could find uh, and then they take that to other members of the group and say oh well you found it you can sing it yes I think they they would instantly grab songs when they were in the booth either together or, or, or in pairs or singly or whatever they would they would grab I want to do this one and, and things did yeah. fall into certain lines John typically would do the Chuck Berry songs and Paul typically would do the little Richard songs but when you've got single tracks like the Donnays or the Marvelettes or, or anything like that, then I, I think it, it might be just whoever bagged it, you know? I mean, whoever whoever had, yeah. had the greatest passion or said, I want to do it, I want to do it. I mean, they're just, yeah, just yeah. They're kids in a booth, you know? I mean, this, we're not talking about yeah. a precise science here. It's who shouts louder or who kicks someone else in the shin and says, no, I'll do it. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, we're talking about enthusiasts and the Beatles were great music enthusiasts and, and what you have on all these EMI and, and BBC recordings is an enthusiasm to, um, to revel in something that they really enjoy, you know, and, and part of the reason that they went for the obscure was because in Liverpool there was this competition of there being other groups as well as the Beatles, you know, so yeah. there might be four, five, six, up to 10, 12 acts even on a bill one night, like the big shows that Sam Leach put on at New Brighton Tower, there would be like 12 acts on one show um, or, you know, whatever number, five, six, seven acts. And um, they'd be in their dressing room and they'd be hearing you know, they, they, they've got what they're going to do written out on a piece of paper and then they hear Jerry and the Pacemakers doing it or they hear yeah. King Size Taylor doing it or whatever and cross that off, cross that off. Yeah. So they were determined to come up with a, a, a repertoire that was unique to them that other people wouldn't know. Mm. They would hear the Beatles do it, but then they couldn't really do it because the Beatles were doing it. Um, there were mm. a few songs that did get done by more than one group, but the Beatles typically, their desire to be different led to them hunting out the particularly obscure tracks and because they yeah. were professional and didn't have day jobs they could hang out all afternoon in nems listening to everything whereas if you had a day job you really didn't have the time to do that so they could dive a lot deeper as a result of that now you mentioned something earlier about um when the beatles went to america they um and i just want to pick up on that because they the great thing was that the, the, the Americans loved the Beatles partly because they were British, they were English, um, and they were different and they were novel to it, novelty in a sense to anything they had seen before. 
but the Beatles were projecting either black American music back into America or their own music, their own Lennon and McCartney songs, which were so heavily black influenced. And so mm. in a sense, they were turning a mirror to American kids, to American music that they may well have missed. And, and yeah. that is a crucial part of their breakthrough in America because everybody was asking them, what music do you listen to? And they would always say black music. We're listening to mm. stuff on uh, Motown from Detroit. Yeah. And um, this was a phenomenal fillip to Barry Gordy at the Motown record label because suddenly they were in the spotlight secondhand, if you like. I mean, yeah. the, the biggest act of all are saying, we like this stuff. And so everyone's looking or listening to that stuff now. And also financially, um, Barry Gordy didn't only have Motown Tamla, Motown Records, he had Joe Beat uh, Music, which was the publishing arm. And most yeah. of the songs, I don't know about the percent, what percentage it was, but it seems to me that most of the key original songs on Motown were published by Joe Beat. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And yeah. um, so, Mot the Motown organization will get like three tenths of the publishing on those early Beatles albums in America. Yeah. And that they were selling by millions. I mean, Meet the Beatles sold yeah, four, yeah. four million before the year was out, four million copies of one album. They're on three tenths of the publishing of that. This was a vast, vast injection yeah. of funds into the Motown organization that came about directly because of the Beatles. They were presumably listening to American radio by now. Were they? Is that where those have come from, or is it just a continuation? Yeah, when the Beatles first go to America, they one of the things that they are consumed by is radio, because they're familiar with the BBC and Radio Luxembourg, and pretty much that's it. Um, but American radio was way more freeform, uh, particularly in the metropolitan areas like New York, where Murray the K on Ten Ten Winds would be playing the good records, and it didn't matter who who the artist was and what skin color they had. I mean, a lot of American radio was segregated, um, but in the metropolitan areas, particularly in New York, it wasn't. And they got into a lot of music through being in America. And in a sense, they helped shape their taste as well. So when they get back from the States, they're making a hard day's night. And on the set of a hard day's night, a journalist comes along from Disc, Disc Weekly, as it was known then, this is an issue from uh, May the 9th, 1964. And on the back cover is a feature called It's the Beatles' Choice, where a journalist, mm. I think it was uh, a guy called Alan Walsh, a Liverpool guy actually, um, asked them to name their favourite records of the moment. And you get incredible insight into what it was they were listening to. Um, Ringo, for example, everything was black. <laughs> Ringo's I Got a Woman by Jimmy McGriff, what Kind of Fool by The Tams, It's All Right by The Impressions, uh, Monkey Time by Major Lance, uh, Love Is Blind by Irma Franklin, uh, and Um 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 by Major Lance. John says, anything by Major Lance is okay by me. So the Beatles had this yeah. thing where they would infuse collectively. So if one liked something, they all tended to like it as well. And they had this shared whether it might be an item of clothing or a hairstyle or a moustache or a record, they would all get into it at the same time. Um, Mary Wells says, John, two lovers. Well, Mary Wells, pretty much as a result of this, was invited by the Beatles to be on their British tour in 1964. She was the first Motown artist to do a, a British tour because the Beatles put her on the tour. Technicality, mm -hmm. she wasn't quite on Motown when she came because she had left by then and gone to 20th Century Fox, but nonetheless, she was, in their eyes, a Motown artist. Um, Who's Loving You by The Miracles? Please, Please, Please by James Brown. This is John. Paul's into James Ray still, if you've got to make a fool of somebody. Ray Charles, Little Richard, Marvin Gaye, Chuck Jackson. He was a big influence mm. on the Beatles, Chuck Jackson. And George says, Daddy Rolling Stone by Derek Martin. Uh, on the American Sioux label, the voice is great, so is the female backing. I particularly like the rhythm, he says. So that's a few months before uh, I feel fine. Uh, Walk on by, High Heel Sneakers by, to by Tommy Tucker. They love that. 
uh, More Merry Worlds, Marvin Gaye, and so on and so on and so on. So their taste evolved, you know, I mean, they did love Elvis and they did love Chuck and they did love Carl and they did love Little Richard but, and Arthur Alexander, but but they sure love Marvin Gaye and, and, and um, Otis Redding. They absolutely loved a whole range of music and, and were completely smitten by Motown. And yet Motown appeared to repeat the, the trick and, and appeared to be smitten by the Beatles. Was that commercial or was that love? I think it was love. I think it was a two-way love affair, Motown, got, Motown and the Beatles. Yeah. Um, no, I think it was genuine. We've got, we've got that album. Yeah, we've got that album by the Supremes, A Little Bit of Liverpool. Uh, and a terrific version of by the Supremes of You Can't Do That. Yes, which of course John said was inspired by Wilson Pickett. So it's yeah. the black America by Liverpool coming back to America again. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I think it was real because the thing about the, uh, so many things about the Beatles that made them great, one of them is that they wrote amazingly brilliant songs. The Lennon McCartney song catalogue was the greatest popular song catalogue of of the 20th century. I'm going to put my neck out and say yeah. that. And um, a good song is a good song is a good song. And in a sense, adult America, which looked down its nose on the Beatles when they arrived in 64, um, got into them through the appreciation by American artists, respectful, respected American artists of Beatles songs. So when Count Basie did I think he did two Beatles albums in the end, Count Basie. Uh, it was just like, oh, well, these songs do have something then. I mean, Duke Ellington did Beatles songs. Um, mm. So it was Ella Fitzgerald did a Beatles song, or more than one. Um, so it's, suddenly it's like, yeah, actually they do have something. And that was because the songs were brilliant. And Lennon McCartney songs, are, prove themselves adaptable to almost, well, in fact, scrub almost, to all formats of music uh, and, and um, yeah. came across well. So um, I think when, when Motown covered the, there is actually an album called Motown Sings the Beatles, which gathers together, I mean, Stevie Wonder's We Can Work It Out is a fantastic track. Um, it gathers mm. together all these, all these hits and uh, it's a good album because they're great artists doing great songs. It's almost like the, the ultimate compliment to black artists who they revere and respect covering their music, which has its roots in, in rhythm and blues. Do you have a favourite at all? Oh, wow. Um, Esther Phillips and I Love Him. I'll, I'll just name a few because it's hard to name one. Al Green did a great version of I Want to Hold Your Hand, which I'm very partial to. Paul had the honour of having Ray Charles do Eleanor Rigby. I mean, this is the kid in a council house in Allerton listening to What Did I Say? Seven years later, Ray Charles is doing his song, mm. Eleanor Rigby. Um, what else? Um, Something by Isaac Hayes, which is 12 minutes. That's an extraordinary oh, piece. James Brown's cover of Something was George's favourite. Um, I love Otis Redding doing Day Tripper. That is superb. Mm. Um, and Roy Redman doing Good Day Sunshine. That's one that Paul heard in the clubs in the 60s, probably in the Scottish St. James in London, and decided that that was his thing. We're running a little bit out of time, but it, it, have we got time just to talk about the solo rock and roll albums of John and Paul? Because again, it's like a reaffirmation of this is this is where we come from. Strange recording history, 1973-4, but it, essentially, yes, it's John wanting to get away for once from having to write every, you know, everything was first person or from personal experience and bearing his soul or his thoughts or his fears whatever it might be in a song much easier just to go in and do rock and roll and he went in with phil specter and the sessions kind of fell apart but nonetheless <clears throat> some people look down on this album and i don't know why i think it's brilliant i always have and i love i mean his stand by me which he used to do in the cavern with the Beatles, yeah. the Benny King, Stand By Me. That is just sublime. He does some little Richard on here, Slipping and Sliding and Ready Teddy, Rip It Up. It's That's that's a good album for me. I'm very happy with that. I'm glad he did it. And a uh, great cover too. And, and, and there's a kind of, the sort of link between Come Together and Catch Me If You Can. Chuck Berry led to some of the inclusions on there, I think, didn't it? Well, yeah, because um, there's a line, a couple of lines in uh, Come Together that he, he borrowed from 
Chuck Berry's You Can't Catch Me, which I'm sure Chuck would have been fine about, but Chuck probably got them from somewhere else. Um, I mean, I'm, I don't I don't actually mean that, but, you know, a, a borrowing was in the wind. Um, but yeah. the, the publisher got heavy. And in a sense, this album came about because John was forced to record three songs in that publishing catalogue um, as part of his yeah. uh, uh, um, punishment, if you like, or the penalty for... for for lick, yeah. nicking those lines, um, Paul Paul did a couple of albums, didn't he? This is one of them, the Russian album, so called, oh, right. um, which is him in 1987 going into Abbey Road with a, a bunch of musicians and trying to put down. You can see their names there. I'm sure you can all read that. Yeah, see, very well known names there doing playing on this album. Um, one just again it's that thing of they're just rockers at heart really you know i mean mm. no matter what music we all hear in our lives what we hear at the ages of 14 to 16 or 14 to 18 is really at our core and so no matter that you know they've done all they've had you know paul's now been recording music for almost 60 years i dare say i'm not privy to it anymore but i dare say that when he goes in the studio and he wants to jam for a bit or warm up or whatever it might be, that one of these old songs will be what comes to his mind, whether it's Lucille or 20 Flight Rock or whatever it might be. It's it's part of who he is, you know, it's in the DNA. Yeah. And then there was this one, which he did in the immediate aftermath of Linda's death in 1998, probably again, a cathartic experience. Um, so what's on there? Blue Jean Bop. And she said, yeah, that's Larry Williams, all shook up, of course, Elvis, and a few mm. of his own songs as well. But there's some there's some good songs on there. Um, it's just it's just who they are, isn't it? This, the, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, these rock and roll artists in the 50s, and they were the true pioneers, um, then we wouldn't have any of this, you know, because they were the spark mm. that lit the fire. Just just one last thing, Mark. Um, do you think um, black music influence on the Beatles is recognised enough in the narrative when you, when you come to places like Liverpool? It's, 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 it's hard because it's, it's kind of deep knowledge in a sense. I mean, the, it's remarkable yeah. that 50 now coming up 60 years on that the Beatles are still being talked about at all. They utterly deserve it. And I think it's, it seems yeah. clear to me that it's going to last a lot longer than it, it already has. But people knowing them is one thing. People knowing who influenced them or what their origins were is something else again. That is the kind of knowledge that really only comes with the those who are inquisitive enough to find out, to read a book like Tune In yeah. or to check on the internet, whatever it might be. Um, so I don't know whether it's appreciated enough but um, it, it, it's awful to think that um, there might still be any kind of prejudice against any of these artists and the work that they did that was so important, um, or just prejudice. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, it's scary how much prejudice there is again these days. And um, yeah. the Beatles were all about breaking down prejudices and breaking down labels. I mean, we've been talking about yeah. R&B a lot in this conversation. They didn't even really call it R&B because they didn't want to hang a tag on things. Because the moment you hang mm. a tag on something, then you've almost kind of defined it, shaped it, put it in a box, and this is either inside the box or it's outside the box. Their whole yeah. mentality, collective mentality, was to not think like that. And I think that's a very important right. thing to consider yeah. about the Beatles because that was yeah. the best way. <laughs> 